easy, has an on-off switch. <laughs> I'm thankful. I'm Peter, this is my wife Donna. Uh, we are missionaries with FCF in Kenya. Uh, we've been on the mission field now for... Going on 14 years. 14 years. I have to ask her, she remembers, I don't. Um, we've just always been there in my heart. And we're excited about what God is doing. I want her just to say hello and to greet you, and then I'll um, just share something quick after we see a video of, of what we're doing. We want, you know, we kind of like to show you what we're doing. And don't take offense at the music, by the way. Or, or if, if you don't recognize the music, it's okay. <laughs> All right? If you do, don't be offended. <laughs> All right? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain it later, okay? Uh, well, as he said, I'm Donna, and um, I'm the director of our, our medical clinic, and it's uh, called Emmett's Eye Ball Mission Health Center, and it's spelled the English, the center is spelled the English way, R-E instead of E-R. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I took it over in 2013, and until last year, mm -hmm. until last mm -hmm. two years ago, um, 17, mm -hmm. um, we finally got our registration and licensure, mm. and that I was fighting with its MOH Ministry of Health, and um, we finally had to pray the people out. That's right. And that because they were giving us nothing but what, but nothing but problems and, that, and they wouldn't do this because we didn't have that or you know they were always bringing up excuses so we prayed out the team that worked with them and we have a new team that is an answer to prayer yep. exactly. and that they're working with us in fact uh, this last week and that the, a group of them came out and there we hired a registered nurse and so therefore they're going to uh, equip us to be immunization center and a birth center. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in the process. Um, a church in Hawaii donated um, our, mater our basic materials for a laboratory. And, uh, and so we need to complete that. And the, 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 Our whole goal is to be have them become self-sufficient, mm -hmm. not depending on us for everything. I'm proud to say that they have been, on the whole, been able to make their own money for medications. And the, the, we just have to subsidize sometimes now. Um, also, um, we have a, a school of nurse assistants that we, uh, public health training, and we try to do community training, but we're trying to get it, the people out of the mindset that they have to get a free gift every time they come to learn about how they can take care of themselves. <laughs> and we haven't quite gotten that clear with them, but uh, we're working on that because it's important for them to understand how they can take care of themselves and improve their health and not be so sick and not have death and and everything. I mean, malaria is one of our biggest areas, and it's it's easy to take care of, and that. But most of the people don't take care of it in time, so we have death. And uh, if they use a net, that it's preventable because the malaria uh, mosquito attacks at night. And that, so there's a lot of things that are preventable, and that. But they just don't take the time or it's just the lack of knowledge mm -hmm. and that so th those are our, our goals and uh, this last year while we've been in the States I, I was able to make contact with a, a university in um, Ohio Centerville Ohio and uh, they have a tremendous nursing program up to doctorate of nursing and uh, they're praying about connecting with us and they would send their freshman students over for a quarter with instructors mm -hmm. and, the, and the help us. And then also, eventually, maybe we can, we can start a full registered nurse program in our facility. So God those are good. things you can be praying about. Amen. And I say you people take the breath away from me.
but you literally, that's <laughs> taking the breath away from me, <laughs> being in the mountains. <laughs> you, you can tell we're flatliners, all right? <laughs> Praise him. So excuse my shortness of breath. <laughs> Praise God. Um, I'll just kind of follow up with what she's talking about. Uh, we do have the medical clinic. We're getting ready to start the laboratory. We're real excited about what God is doing. But in order to do the laboratory, we have to move our current clinic officer out of his apartment. Now, his apartment was originally a laboratory many, many years ago. And then uh, the laboratory went out, and, and over a period of years, when Don and I decided to go to the mission field there, they made the laboratory into our house. Now, you have to get this in your mind. This, we've come a long way, baby. Uh, we could lay in our bed, and the mold was so bad in that house, it was black. The ceilings were black with mold. And it was just absolutely, if it rained, we had to put blankets over our net to keep us dry. And that's the only way we could keep dry. And, and, and we had no kitchen. We did have a toilet, thank God. I told them that was the only thing I had to have was a toilet. <laughs> A Western style toilet. If you ever go to the east or to Africa and you ask for a toilet, be specific. They will give you a hole in the ground and it does qualify, but it's not very comfortable. So, um, you know, they had given us that and, and we did have that at least. And so this place is already set up with a, with, a, with a toilet in it and we've got a place that we can make a collection center and one, one uh, room has some sink in it already. We need to add another sink, but that's, that's a small thing. And we're real excited about how we can make this into a really, really high-class laboratory. Uh, but we need to move our clinic officer out. And he doesn't particularly want to live out under the stars because we live in the rainforest, so we get rain all the time. So uh, just stand in agreement with us that God's opening up doors for us. We thought we would have to build him a new house. But God gave us a plan. I wasn't real happy with it, but I'm smiling and saying, thank you, Jesus, we have a plan. And we're taking our guest house that we have and making it into his residence. And then Don and I are going to build a house for ourselves. We don't have a place there. And the Lord just really dealt with us, build yourself a house. He downloaded the, the plans in my, in my spirit about a year ago. And I thought, what is this? And, and then I felt the Lord say, this is your house. And I said, this is way too big. We don't need this big of a space. But now I see the, the purpose behind it because our guest house will be gone. And so our guest house will now be on the second story of our house so that our guests have a place. We can, we can house up to, I think, it's 16 people in our, in, our, in our second story guest house after we build the place. So just stand in agreement with it. That's all we ask for. You just pray for us, intercede for us when you think about us. Look at our picture, pray for us. Say, thank you, Jesus. Everything is being fulfilled that you have promised. We've got just a short video. It's two minutes long, a little over two minutes long, just to kind of give you a feel of, of what we're doing in Kenya. So you can go ahead and run that. And I'll get out of your way. <laughs>
that gives you a little idea of, of some of the things. I did, we did forget to mention, we have a Bible school. Uh, we started a Bible school in 2011, and we have graduated over 300 students, over 400 students since 2011. And it's a four-year institution. You have to go four years to get your diploma. Or your, yeah, your diploma. And we are believing God to become a degree program where we'll be accredited by uh, the government, the Ministry of, of Education in Kenya. One of the uh, uh, members of parliament that is a friend of ours came to visit us in Iowa in October. And we were sitting and talking. He said, when you come back to Kenya, we will walk together into the Ministry of Education. I will get you a provisional license. I will get you a provisional registration. And I'll get you a provisional accreditation. And uh, so we're looking forward to that because it's going to allow us to increase. So keep us in prayer. Amen. Things are expanding. Praise God. Before I get in the word, I do need to explain two things. Number one, what is a jigger clinic? A jigger clinic is, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a critter. It's, it's, it's a bug. And, and it digs into your feet to start with. It's, 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 it's residences in the the dirt or the manure in Kenya. Most of our houses, when they are built, are built with a mixture of manure and dirt. If you are, are coming as a guest to a, a, a home in the bush, they will oftentimes freshly manure their, their, their floors for you. <laughs> yeah, we thought you'd like to have that. It is a combination of dirt and manure. People say, does this stink? Yeah, it has a smell. <laughs> Um, it's not what, as bad as you think it is, but it definitely has a distinct smell. But it's just a way of honoring you. Sometimes they'll even plaster their walls freshly with this mixture to make sure that everything looks nice. Um, huh? And stencil it, yeah, and they will even stencil it. And, but this is just, these, these bugs dwell in, these, in, in, in this environment. And of course, people are barefoot most of the time, and so the jiggers will dig into your feet. Well, the problem is when they dig into your feet, they will then multiply like rabbits in your feet, and then it'll grow up your legs and even into your torso and body, and it can kill you. And there are people that have become totally immobile because of these jiggers. And so we have done some jigger clinics to help eliminate that problem and get rid of the jiggers. You can't just eliminate them in the person, however, you also have to go to the home. And so we'll have the jigger clinics like we had that you saw on the screen. What you don't see is we have the Ministry of Health working with us, and then they go to these individual homes and spray the homes for jiggers. And then there's follow-up done every two weeks for a while to make sure that the jiggers don't come back. Um, it, they used to be very invasive. They would dig into the skin to dig out these jiggers, and it was painful. But they have a new medication now that you just apply and it suffocates and kills the jiggers and then you're fine. So we're very excited about that program and we're doing that. The second thing I wanted to kind of touch base on is, yes, I've been kidnapped four times in, in Africa. The first time was in 1991. It was my fault. I was walking down the wrong street at the wrong time. I knew better. And uh, I got accosted and, and, and cast into a room and told I was going to prison for the rest of my life. And, I would never see the light of day again, ever, ever. And I just looked at him and smiled, and I said, that's a hoax. I said, I've been hoodwinked. And uh, God just opened up a door, and just I got out like within just a few minutes. It was just amazing. I'm usually not that bold, OK? I, but I, there was no fear whatsoever. The second time we were in um, was the first time that Donna came with me, and we were in Mombasa, Kenya. And we were going back to the airport, and our taxi driver got accosted and took us all and for a ransom. Well, of course, you don't get much ransom from us because we don't believe in that. But uh, God, again, delivered us. And then we had it happen once again. And when we crossed the border into Uganda the first time, this all back in 2006. Uh, and then later that same day was the, th the fourth time. That was the most scary, I guess, of all of them because they pulled us off of the road. They threw a, a spike out in front of the road and the van veered off into the ditch to miss the spike. Two guys came, one on the driver's side, one on the passenger side. The passenger was our assistant driver. And these two guys started to beat the devil out of these, the, the driver and the assistant. I mean, they were literally almost drying blood. And we're sitting right behind the driver. And Donald looks at me and she goes, should we be nervous? <laughs> 
And I looked behind me because I knew that the pastor we were with was behind me and he was sound asleep. And I said, when he gets nervous, we'll get nervous. And so pretty soon he woke up. He said some things in their language, which was not even Swahili. We didn't understand it. And he gave him something small and then we were on our way. Later I found out he gave him 2,000 Ken or Uganda shillings um, to allow us to pass and to leave us alone. And I thought, wow. That's great, until I got to the exchange and found out Uganda shillings are worth 2000 to $1. I told the guy, go back, we're worth more than a dollar. <laughs> Praise God. So those were our experiences. But, you know, since that time, we really haven't had any problems at all. And part of the thing is, 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 is Pastor was talking about, you have to be aware, and you have to be in the, you know you're in the will of God. And they know you're walking in the favor of God. And that's what your confession is. I walk in the favor of God. So we've always said, we walk in the, since 2006, we have said we walk in the favor of God. When I started driving in Kenya, I was told by American missionaries, be careful, you know, they're going to they're gonna take you. They're going to do all this bad stuff to you. We have never once had a bad experience in all the years that I've driven in Kenya with any police, with any authorities whatsoever. The only thing they do is stop us to hear my accent to find out where you're from. And then they can't figure it out anyway, because when I'm there, I sound very Kenyan. So, um, yeah, so we know how to deal with things now. Another thing, uh, honest to God, I have a, a message. I am not preaching it this morning, but I have a message on praying in the Holy Ghost. And praying in the Holy Ghost will save your hide. We were, and I'm just being straight with you. We were, we were going from one part of Nairobi to another a few years ago, and we were just praying and worshiping God. It was just Donna and I in the vehicle. We were just worshiping God. We knew there was going to be traffic jams. That's just a given in Nairobi. But we wanted to get the fastest traffic jam, you know, the one we can get through the fastest. And so I said, let's take this back road, and it was through an area that was kind of shady toward one of the, one of the most um, populated ghetto areas, if you will, one of the most populated slums in Nairobi. And I said, but we'll be okay. We're just going to go through. It's no problem. And so we get to this one junction, and everything came to a stop. Well, you can't do anything. When you're stopped, you're stopped. So we decided, let's just redeem the time. We're just going to worship God. So we started praying in the Holy Ghost and just singing in the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, something on the inside of both of us rose up and we started, it was like we were praying. In, you know what it's like to worship God in the Spirit? And then what it's like to intercede in the Spirit. And we knew we crossed over into that intercession. And I said, I don't know what's going on. But, you know, and then about that time I looked at my watch and I saw it was 5, I think it was 525. We had an appointment at 7 and we had to get across town and get changed to get this appointment. And I thought, Donna, we have to get out of here. And honestly, there was nobody coming the other way. And so I got into the ongoing traffic lane and took off and went around the roundabout the wrong way. I told Donna, you pray we don't find any cops. Don't you judge me. <laughs> <clears throat> and we got out of that mess and we just went on our way. Well, we were at dinner at 7 o'clock and the, the, the lady that we were at dinner with came out and she was just ashen. She said, did you hear what happened today? And I said, no. She said at this particular junction was right where we were. There was a car bombing and 35 people were killed and a number were injured. See, if you pray in the Holy Ghost, God will save your hide. Hello, he will open a door for you to get out of whatever you think or the devil thinks he has you into, okay? So, you know, it's real important when you travel, when you go to Mexico, don't be afraid. If, if God's with you, you don't have to be afraid at all. You just go. I hear people all the time say, we don't send people in Mexico anymore because they're going to kidnap you. No, they're not going to kidnap you if you're in the will of God. Yeah. And if they do kidnap you, get them saved. <laughs> and they'll let you go. <laughs> Praise God. That's what they did to Paul and Silas. The head, he was just talking about it. They were in the inner prison giving thanks unto God. And the earth shook. The chains fell off. The prisoners all got saved. The jailer got saved. I mean, everybody got born again. Praise God. What a testimony. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Well, let's get into the word, okay? Let's pray for just a moment. Father, I just thank you for your word, and I thank you that this word can come alive in our lives and in our hearts. And Father, I know that I'm not going to say anything here that's new revelation. I'm not going to say anything that people can go, oh, I never heard that before. Because it's your word. And your word is eternal, and we've heard your word. We've heard it. 
But I thank you that you'll stir up again on the inside of us the truths that we'll begin to see in a different light and begin to walk in it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we're going to deal out of uh, Colossians chapter 2. Honestly, I've been stuck in Colossians chapter 2 for over a year. Last year when we came to the States in 2018, um, God had me do this message in a lot of churches that we went to. And every time I try to move away from this and get into something else, God always brings me right back to it. And so I'm studying on it and just keep meditating on it. So as we came to the close of 2019 and into the new year, uh, you know, you have a tendency when the new year comes to evaluate what happened in the old year and we call them resolutions of what we want to see in the new year. Now, frankly, I don't make New Year's resolutions anymore because they never lasted for me. But I do understand the desire to lay out thoughts and ideas. And I know that your leadership is getting ready to go away on a retreat to actually plan out the next six months of your church activity here. And I know that that's really important. I'm not, I'm not saying that's not important. But um, I, I do understand the needing of doing this. So this morning I wanted to encourage you as we are in this new year not to forget the gospel. Yes. All right? In Colossians, we see real depth into what is accomplished in Christ. And we're going to be reading from verse 20, or 6 to 23, but I guarantee you we'll not make it to 23. We may, if we're lucky, make it to 10. If we're lucky. And I'm believing God will make it at least that far. I am a teacher more than a preacher, okay? And that's my call, that's my gift. And so you know what it is with teachers. Sometimes teachers can get boring and put you to sleep. So I'm asking God that you stay awake. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. And, 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 but also a teacher doesn't get real excited. Brother Hagin was a teacher more than a preacher. Now he could preach, but he was a teacher. And he could just stand in one place and talk. Now I don't stand in one place. Okay, I do walk. So I'm a walking teacher. And, um, uh, but just keep that in mind as we go forward. All right, I want to start with verse 6. We're going to read the first part of this first. It says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. Now I want us to stop there for just one moment. Because I think it's important for us to reflect. Paul says, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. Well, how did you receive him? You know? Think back, how did you receive Jesus? Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. Well, verse 9 says, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I want you to notice there's two parts to this. There's confession and there's believing. It's not good just to get somebody to say the sinner's prayer. Okay? They can say the sinner's prayer till they're blue in the face, but if they don't believe, it doesn't do them any good. It doesn't do any good for you to have people say, say this after me, Jesus is my Lord. But if they don't believe it, hello, it doesn't work. You have to believe and confess. Now truly, the word of faith has kind of, uh, you know, they, they didn't mess it up. They brought the truth out right. But the problem is the people messed it up. And we got to thinking we say it to believe it, but that's not true. You say it because you believe it. All right? If you believe it, that'll be the confession of your mouth. There's a lot of times we get into this idea of confession. Do you know the word confession is consistent throughout the New Testament? It means to say the same thing as. Yes. Say the same thing as what? Say the same thing as God. So when you're making a confession of faith, what you're saying is the same thing as God, but you're saying it because you believe it, not to get what you're wanting to receive. Okay? And I don't know about y'all, but we've been in Word of Faith for a long time. When we started, we got that confused. We thought we had to say it in order to believe it, in order to receive it. And I realized one day, no, you have to believe it then your confession will come naturally. See, that's why you'll hear people make all these come, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed when they're in church and then Monday morning they go to church or they go to work. Oh, I'm so sick. <laughs> Where'd that come from? That's a bad confession. No, that's probably what they really believe. That's right. 
all right? They really don't believe that they are healed. They really do believe they're still sick, and so they'll just make that confession comes naturally. And, and, and it's so important to understand, how do we, we receive Jesus? Believing and saying. And then over in Ephesians chapter 2, the reference is 4 through 9. I'm just going to read verse 8. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. How were you saved? By grace through faith. What does that mean? That grace is what God has made available to you by his son. Regardless of how you've acted or how you've behaved. That's what grace is. You don't deserve it. But he gave it to you. And then it says you receive what he's given to you by faith. And then he says, that's not even of yourself. It's a gift of God. Yeah. See, God gives you faith to receive what he's given you. Now, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, the next part of the verse says, so walk in him. That's real simple. <clears throat> We've made this complicated. We think that we believe and receive Jesus as Lord, make our confession, but then we have to live right, we have to do A, B, C, we have to do this and this and this to walk right with God. But that's not what he said. He said, do it the same way. How? By grace, through faith. What did you do to deserve salvation? Nothing. It was his grace that gave you the, 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 his salvation. It's his grace that Jesus shed his blood for you. It was by his grace that Jesus' body was broken for your healing. Okay? There's nothing you did to deserve it. There's nothing you did to even receive it because the faith was a gift from God. So how do we walk in him? Now we're going to walk out our daily life the same way. By grace, through faith. By grace, through faith. Uh, look over to Coloss or Galatians. I love this scripture and... and, and I get in trouble with it, especially in the Hispanic church, because I don't know Mexican very well. I'm not really well versed in Spanish, but I think I know how to speak it. You know how dangerous that is? So I'm reading this verse in English, and, and, and then I tried to, just in my head, translate it one time when I was in a Spanish church, and I said a word that is very offensive, but it got everybody's attention. But listen to what he says, chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect in the flesh? See, this is, this is the point. We get the idea that, that, that we've got to be sanctified by what we do. No, you're sanctified because of what Jesus did. Yes. Sanctified means to be set apart. You know, you're actually made holy because of what Jesus did, not by your acts. Whew. Boy, it gets a little bit <sighs> soft in places. But it's true that we got to learn to walk in the same way as we received. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. God loved me so much. He gave it to me and he gave me faith to receive it. Yes. And so now I'm going to receive my daily walk in the same way. Now he says, you foolish Galatians. And one version says it this way. You stupid Galatians. <laughs> Who has bewitched you? So I said in Spanish, you estupido. And that's quite offensive, I guess, in Spanish. I didn't know that at the time. I did learn that that was. But I said, I got your attention, didn't I? <laughs> and I think Paul could be kind of offensive, especially when it came to these principles. Don't be foolish. Don't think that you're, you're living right. I'm not telling you not to live right. Now hear what I'm saying. But don't think that your living right has made you right with God. If you living right would make you right with God, you didn't need Jesus. You could do it by yourself. That's right. But the truth of the matter is, I can't live right without the power of the Holy Ghost and the grace of God operating my life. Yes. That is the only way I can walk right. That is the only way I can walk in righteousness, is understanding 
He has made me righteous. And when I have that understanding and I make that confession, I am the righteousness of God, then I can begin to walk in it. I'm saying it because I believe it. I love the, the confession that we did this morning was so good. And I love the one at the end of uh, James, it says, the fervent and effectual prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Do you know we quote that and quote that and quote that, and a lot of people think, well, my prayer doesn't avail much because I'm not righteous. Liar. We have a class on righteousness in our church, in our school, and it's first year class. I, I used to teach it. I don't anymore, but I used to teach it, and um, I'd get in the class, the first, the first class, and I'd say, how many of you, and remember, this is a Bible school, people training for ministry. How many of you, by lifting your hands, would say you're born again? And of course, everybody's hand went up. I said, all right, put your hand down. I said, how many of you, by lifting your hand, will say I am righteous? And not one person lifted their hands. And I said, who lied? You or God? I've had people leave the school over that. We can't be righteous. No, not in yourself. Jesus made you righteous. And if you're born again, you are the righteousness of God. You're not becoming the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. Many people are trying to become rather than believing who they are. Romans chapter 3, uh, or chapters 8, verses four, uh, 3 and 4, basically says this, God did what the law could not do. See, if the law could have made you righteous, it would have done so. Paul says if there was any law that could have saved, this was the law. But it couldn't save. That's why God had to come in Christ to make you free. You are in the spirit. Remember, we are not converts. Please, people, remember this. We are not converts to Judaism. To Judaism. I did not convert to Judaism. Now, I'm not taking away from the Jewish people. Understand me. But I was born a Gentile, and I will die a Gentile. But I thank God that Jesus made available to me the gift of salvation just like he made it available to the Jew. And by the same means, by faith in Christ, we come into a relationship with God. Yes. We are adopted into the family of God, not into Judaism. So remember where your covenant is. Yes. Okay? Let's quit talking about the old covenant as if it's ours. It's not. We have a new covenant in Christ's blood. Yes. Amen? So as you received him, how did you receive him? By grace, through faith. Now, walk in him. Day by day, just say, Father, I thank you. I've got news for you. If God's grace has not provided it for you, you cannot get it. But I've got good news for you. Everything you need for life, he has provided for you. I remember when Donna and I were first talking about going to Kenya, and listen, I mean, you know, people think, people think, that's the problem, they think, but uh, people look at us and they think, oh, you got money, or you got, you know, you got all sorts of resources and the whole thing, and I'm going, I don't understand this resources business. I don't have money. What are you talking about? You have money. We don't have money, but see, people look at us and they think we have money. We drive a car, we, we travel. In the last month, we have traveled over 10,000 miles. Now, thankfully, 5,000 of that was on a flight back and forth to Hawaii. But still, that's a lot of miles. And now we're getting ready to go another 1,500 miles back to the Midwest. Then in March, we'll do another, what, it's about 1,800 miles from there back to San Diego. And then we'll fly 20,000 miles or 10,000 miles over to our home before we bring the 10,000 to come back. We, we tra do a lot of traveling. People watch us on Facebook and they think, man, you guys tire us out. How do you do this? Well, it's by the grace of God, okay? But see, I don't have money to do this. We didn't have money to go to Kenya. We were sitting at home. I was sitting uh, in my backyard and just kind of praying in the Holy Ghost. And I remember the Spirit of God say to me, what will you say to me on that day when I said, what did you do with the vision I put in your heart for Kenya? I said, hey, that's really easy. Where's the money? <laughs> Hello? I don't know if you've tried this or not. American Airlines, British Airways, and Delta all wants money up front before they give you a ticket to go anywhere. 
And I said, I don't have any money to go to Kenya. I don't have any money. And immediately on the inside of me, the words started to spring up. Uh, Philippians 4.19, my God shall meet all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 32, he who gave his own son, will he not through him also give you all things to enjoy? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, um, in him, well, uh, let's see. Ah, now I got to go read it because I'm going to misquote it. The minute I think I've got it. And this one I use all the time. I really ought to know it. Second Peter chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Both. Not just godliness, but also to life. One version puts it this way. God's given you everything you need to live life to the full. That means to complete what he's called you to do. And so I said, Lord, I'm sorry. If I have to swim the uh, Pacific Ocean to get to Kenya, I will do so. But I will go to Kenya. And you know, after making that determination, the needs started to be met. And we started to see a result. Now, we be just believe we're going to receive what God has given us. Amen? Praise God. Now, look over to Colossians again, chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 7. <clears throat> rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. You know what reality you walk in is the reality you really know and what you're established in. The reality you're walking in is what you really know. And if you're not renewed in the spirit of Accord, uh, in your mind according to the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to renew our minds to the Word of God. Being rooted in Him is being rooted in His Word. Luke chapter 6 uh, verses 46 to 49, Jesus talks about the men who dug deep to build a foundation. Okay? He dug deep in the Word to build a foundation, to lay a foundation on the rock. We used to sing the song, the wise man built his house upon the rock, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. One version says that the man dug deep to build his house on the rock. We have to dig deep into the word of God, okay, to become established in the word of God. Yes. Praise God. You know, when I was first saved, you could talk me out of my salvation. Because I wasn't established in it. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So I could be talked out of it fairly easy. But I got established in salvation. And guess what? Nobody could talk me out of it. I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Spoke with other tongues. And I mean, you know, I got involved in this to the point of where after a year or so, I was so deeply entrenched. I knew. I'd seen the Spirit of God move. I'd seen the miraculous happen. I'd seen the benefits of praying in the Spirit. And then I started dating this girl. It was not her. And I started dating this girl, and she was a Baptist, and she believed that speaking in tongues was of the devil. And so she wanted to set me straight. And I sat her down. I said, sweetheart, you have come too late to the party. You cannot shake me from this. I know that I've been filled with the Holy Ghost, and I know the benefits of praying in other tongues. And if you can't walk with that, that's okay. We can be friends. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Hello? Yeah. Yes. Getting established is going to cause thanksgiving to happen in your heart. Why? Because you're established in the Word. Yes. Nothing will move you. I like one version in, in the Psalms that says, your heart is fixed, established, trusting in the Lord. Hallelujah. You know, if you're going to get rooted and built up in him, you need to get rooted in the word of the gospel, in your covenant. Now, I stress that a lot, especially in Kenya. Boy, they love the old covenant. They talk the old covenant all the time. We went for years to these ministers' conferences. Not one of them had a theme out of the New Testament. They were all out of the Old Testament. Now, I don't have a problem with the Old Testament. Please understand me. But our focus becomes that covenant and not our covenant. See, whatever you read in the old covenant, you have to be sure to read through the eyes of the cross. Yes. Jesus died 
on the cross. The old covenant was taken away. The new covenant was established. Does that mean there's nothing in the old covenant for us to learn from? No, because the old covenant points to the new covenant. Yes. Praise God. There are things in the old covenant. See, I have a problem with people who get all caught up in the old covenant law. Those laws were pointing to the freedom we have in Christ. Yes, they are. Hallelujah. I mean, you take a look at the Sabbath day. I'm, I'm going to pick on you. I'm sorry. I'm going to pick on this now. People get all hung up. When is the Sabbath day? Is it Saturday or Sunday? I got news for you. It's every day. Take a look at the beginning of the Sabbath. Seven days God took to create the earth, right? Six days. On the sixth day, who was his last creation? Man. What happened on the seventh day? Rest. Man was created for rest. Now what happened on the eighth day? Oh, there was no eighth day. The Bible doesn't talk about an eighth day. What happened was that man decided that they were going to use their own wisdom and took of the tree that was, they were told not to take of and began an era of their, uh, a, a dispensation, if you will, where man was going to be judged on the basis of their actions and deeds, not on the grace of God. Okay? The Sabbath day was created for eternity. That's why in Hebrews it says, labor to enter into his Sabbath, into his rest. Yes. What's his rest? Knowing who you are in Christ. That's right. Being established in the word. There's nothing more restful than being established in his word. A few, years, uh, a few months ago, uh, I qualified for Medicare. Praise God. And um, <clears throat> so I decided since I hadn't seen a doctor since 2013, maybe I should go and see if I'm okay. So I went to the doctor and they found three things that were wrong and wanted to tr deal with them and so they were doing so. Uh, one of them, nothing was wrong at all. The other one could be adjusted with medication. And the third one, they, were th they thought I might have cancer. And so I did a biopsy and when they came back, they said yes you have cancer. Well, I don't have cancer. I'm sorry, I won't take cancer. There's, there's an organ in my body that is cancerous, but it's not mine. You understand? Why? Because I'm rooted and grounded in the Word. I know the Word says, by His stripes I am healed. Not going to be healed, I am healed. I am healed right now. So the doctor said, comes in and says, you have cancer. Donald was standing there. I think he was disappointed with our reaction. Because I said, what are you going to do about it? And he said, well, these are the options. He gave me some options. He said, but the best one for you is to do a, a chirogenic freeze uh, of the cancer, and we can do that in your case. And I said, well, it's freezing outside. Why don't we just strip me naked and roll me around in the snow a bit? Won't that take <laughs> care of it? And he just laughed, and he looked at me. He said, you are a nut. And I said, I'm not concerned. And I'll tell you why I'm not concerned. Because the word says, by stripes, I am healed. Amen. I'm already healed. Now, you want to do the freeze? Let's do the freeze. But if we don't do the freeze, it's still not going to affect the outcome. Right. I'm healed. But I also believe God uses doctors. Yeah. You cannot run a medical center and not believe in doctors. Hello. <laughs> That's true. Now, I'm not, in, I'm not excited. I didn't want to do chemotherapy. I didn't want to do radiation. I've had family members that have gone through that and seen the pain they've gone through. And so I had just said, I really would prefer not to do it. He says, no, if we do the freeze, you will have no chemo. You'll have no radiation. I said, well, after we do the freeze, when will you tell me I can go back to Kenya to live? He said, two weeks. I said, deal. And I'm holding you to the two weeks. But there was no concern. You understand there was no concern. Why? Because I was fixed in the word. We were, leaving the doctor, we were leaving the doctor's office after they did the biopsy the first time, and Donna says, is it wrong that we're not even concerned about this? And I said, no, it's really, it should be natural to the Christian. Yes. It should be natural to us. And we're not concerned about these bad reports. Why? Because we're fixed in the Word. Right. Now, know your covenant. Look at the terms of the new covenant over here in, in um, uh, well, I think it's right here. Oh, no, it's in Hebrews. It says, Hebrews chapter 8. 
It says, look at the terms of this covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. You can say that. I'll put my word in their minds and write them in your heart. And I will be their God and they will be my people. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will no longer remember. <coughs> Praise God. God is no longer remembering your sin or your lawless deeds. Paul had a great revelation of this. You remember in, in Corinthians, he made the comment, he said, look at me, I have wronged no man. And I remember the first time I read that, I thought, oh, I've caught Paul in a lie. Don't you remember his history? He persecuted the church. He was there at the death of Stephen, the first martyr of the church, endorsing what they were doing. Yes. Guilty. I thought to myself, I wonder if Paul has the audacity to go before Stephen's mama and say, I have wronged no man. I wonder how she would feel about that. And the Spirit of God said, no, you have missed it. That was the Saul, the old man, any man who's in Christ has become a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Paul became a new man when he came to know Jesus. You became a new man or woman when you came to know Jesus. Those old things have passed away. Yeah, but I still fall into doing them. I still, you know, sometimes I slip. That doesn't matter. It's not based on what you do. It's based on what you believe. That's our covenant with God, okay? And knowing this covenant will cause you to just abound with thanksgiving. Ah, man, you'll be so grateful. You'll be so happy. You'll just be happy all the time. Look at verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. You know, I have become known as the religion killer in Kenya. I, I have embraced it, I will tell you. Man's philosophy not based in Jesus is a vain philosophy. It is empty. And meaning it may make sense, it may sound good, but if it's not based in the word, it's empty and it's meaningless. When we preach the traditions, even the church, and even Pentecostal churches and charismatic churches, when we preach traditions over the gospel, people are not saved. A works-based salvation or a works-based maintaining your salvation is not glorifying God. It's not preaching the gospel. In every culture, there are traditions that have been adopted by the Christian church that lead people to believe that your eternal security is based on something you do. You got denominations that believe you're not really saved till you're immersed in water. Yes. You got other denominations that really believe you're not really saved unless you take Holy Communion once a week and receive the body of Christ. <laughs> so you're saved for the week, brother. You don't. You can go home and don't worry about it. But if you don't come next week to receive Communion, uh, you, you might not be there. Hello. There are traditions that teach us what you wear, what you eat, determine your acceptance before God. Yeah. We had a lady in Kenya one time, when we first went there in 20, or 26, I heard this lady preach, and she'd just get in front of ladies, and she'd just slap her hands, I mean, scare the tar right out of me. And, and she was just real forceful about it. And uh, uh, so I asked the, the person I was sitting next to, I said, can you kind of interpret what she's saying? And he said, well, basically she's saying that if a woman doesn't wear a head covering and doesn't always wear a dress, that she's not pleasing God and she's condemned and will go to hell. And I thought, Jesus, this is not the, this is not the gospel. You know, and I thought, well, hmm. You know, it's not my group. I can't do anything. So I just prayed. Well, we announced in, in 2010 we were going to open the school and this lady came to me and she said, I want to come to Bible school. And I thought, Jesus, I don't need this religion in my Bible school. I don't need, she was a tough lady, okay? I mean, you know, I like to pick my battles, and if that woman looked like she can beat me, I think I might just let her go. 
all right? And I was really nervous, and I said, Lord, what am I going to do? And the Lord said, just let her come. So we let her come. She came. She went through the Bible school. After four years, she started teaching. We, we trained her to be a teacher. She's one of my best teachers now in the Bible school. After the third year, she quit wearing a headdress. And I said, what happened? She said, I got set free from religion. Now, there are still some religious traditions that they continue to do. That, but, you know, she's been released of many. What you eat, what you wear, baptism, communion, bowing in church. In, in Kenya, it's very common for people to come in and bow. And I'm telling you, they'll come in. I don't know if this will hold me or not. Can I sit on this? Okay. They'll, they'll come into church and they'll go like this. Doesn't matter what's going on in the church. They can be doing praise and worship. They can be dancing, whatever. When you come into church, you go to the chair, you go like that. Well, one of our students, who's a, one of our graduates and now one of my teachers, asked his church one time, why do you do that? We're praying. Are you really? Well, it's tradition, but it's meaningless. You understand? Bowing in church. We went in church one time in Kenya, and we got done preaching the word, and the pastor said to me, now we're going to step down off the platform, and we're going to turn around and face the altar, and we'll bow, bow deeply. And I said, what are we bowing to? <laughs> and he says, the presence of God is on the altar. I said, uh-uh, the Bible says the presence of God is in me. Right. If I'm going to bow to anything, I ought to bow to myself. Now that'll really trip you out when you think about it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But I'll say things like that to get their attention. Look, God doesn't live there. God lives here. When I leave this place, he's going with me. He's not staying there. The building is not the residence of God. The human heart is the residence of God. But you see, religious tradition has torn that all away. We don't want our kids in the sanctuary because they might upset the Holy of Holies. Oh, give me a break. That's right. Give me a break. Kids, do not bother me. We, we were, did a service in Hawaii, and one of the ladies came and said, well, we want to come, but I've got a child, and, and we don't have child care. I said, they don't bother me. Sit in the front row. If they escape and come to me, I'll just pick them up. If they'll let me, and we'll just keep on going. We're not going to stop. We're just not going to stop. They don't bother me. It's just I'm not going to allow it to bother me. But we get this idea that, you know, the different religious ideas that we've got. Hello? <laughs> baptism. I hate to pick on baptism. I do believe in being immersed, but you know immersion does not save you. It is only an explanation or an exclamation of what you've already experienced. And if you only believe in immersion, what are you going to do with people who can't get in the water? I have a brother that cannot be in the water when he wanted to be baptized. And so we Figured that one out. We took him down to the lake, laid him out over the pier, and just dumped water over his head and baptized him. Because he couldn't get wet. He literally couldn't get wet. What are you going to do? Refuse people to be baptized because they can't get wet? No. Of course not. See, I'm, I, I don't mean to pick on different things. I'm just saying, let's get off of those ideas onto the truth. The truth is, what God has provided for you in Christ is by faith in him alone, not in these other actions and deeds that go on. Not that those actions and deeds aren't important. I believe in taking communion. My wife and I take communion every day because we know that that is the body and blood of Christ that has been broken for our healing and shed for our redemption. And we make our declaration of faith. We are the healed and we are righteous when we take our, our communion every day. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not saying it's not important. I was my wife and I were both baptized. When, after we were married, we'd been, I'd been born again for a number of years before I got baptized by immersion. But I finally did it because I knew I needed to have a place I could go back and say, old man was put right there. You understand what I'm saying? So these things have significance, and we are told to do them, but they are not your salvation. See, don't get cheated with men's philosophies. Mark uh, chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus says, You make the word of God of no effect with the traditions of men. I don't want to make the word of God of no effect in my life. I want it to be alive. Look at verses 9 and 10, and we're going to stop with 9 and 10. I told you we'd only get to 9 and 10. 
And I'm pushing to get there, but I want to pick on something here, so we're going to go here. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head and principal, uh, uh, principality and power. Now, listen to what he said. In him, in who? In Christ. Dwells the fullness, not partialness, the fullness of God bodily. Do you agree? The fullness of God lives in Christ. Yes. Amen? And you. Now listen. I don't know how many times I was raised believing this. I was raised in a pastor's home. And I, even after I got filled with the Holy Ghost and went to a Pentecostal church Bible study on Wednesday nights, or it was actually on Monday nights, and, and, and they would teach us, Jesus had the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but we only have a part. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that you are complete in him. Now, complete in the Greek means this, to fill, fulfill, be full, complete. Be full. If you full, how much fuller can you get? It means to replete, to cram, level up, fill up, fulfill, make full, come full, perfect, 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 perfect supply. You are. He didn't say you are becoming. He said you are complete in him. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this, Don't be conform, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Our minds are the place where we have to bring under control. When you're born again, you have a new spirit. That's the new creation. But your mind and your flesh, you have to deal with. Now I want to tell you something. There's nothing sinful about the flesh. It's just the flesh. Now it can do sinful things. But don't confuse flesh with sin. All right? Because if you do, you're going to mess yourself up. But now the flesh has always enjoyed doing the ABC. But the spirit man says, no, you shouldn't do ABC anymore. You need to do this instead. The mind is going to be the governing force. Your mind, will, and emotions, that soul is what we call it, is going to control. We need to get control of our souls. Our minds are the place where we have to bring them under control. And this passage in Colossians brings that to light. Now, if something is full or crammed full, how much more can you put in it? Nothing. So here's the first thing to renew your mind to. You are full of God. I never went to the bars, okay? I was never a bar hopper. I'll never forget the, I turned 18, this back in the days when 18 was legal uh, to drink, and they just made it legal to drink. I turned 18, I went to college, I was with a, a buddy of mine in college, we went to Pizza Hut, and we ordered pizza, and I was going to order a Coke, and he ordered a beer, and he says, oh, just get a beer. And I thought, yeah, I'm of age, I can do what I want to do. So I ordered a beer, I took one sip of it, nearly lost my cookies all over everything else. I said, this stuff is gross, and I put it down. He says, oh, don't worry, you'll get accustomed to it. I said, dude, I don't need to get accustomed to something I don't really want. So I didn't touch it again. Now I did later, after we got married, I said, mm, I'm married now, I can do what I want. So I bought a six pack of beer, brought it home, and Donald said, what are you doing with that beer? I said, well, I'm married, I can do what I want. And so I poured myself a beer, took one sip of it, generally lost my cookies again, put it at the back of the fridge, saved it for her brother-in-law. When he came, he took the whole thing, went home. He liked it, not me, not me. You understand what I'm saying? I didn't never do the bars. But there were other things that I did do. And what, I, what helped me get free from some of that stuff is to know God lives in me. So if I have a problem with alcohol and I walk into a bar, God lives in me. Yes. He didn't stop at the door. He went in there with you. That's right. Hello? Yep. And that consciousness helped me govern what I was doing. Because I realized he's with me. Yeah, but I can't help it. No, you probably can't help it. 
but greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Brother Copeland had a, medica a meditation out this morning, his um, daily meditation. He said he realized at one point when they lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the greater one lives inside of me. God lives in me. We have to understand that. So now here's my, here's my question to you. If the greater one lives on the inside of you, if you are filled with the fullness of God, because you are in Christ Jesus, then why do we keep asking God to give us more of him? I have a daughter in Kenya, a Kenyan lady who adopted Donna and I as her parents. She calls me the praise and worship killer. Because I can't tolerate certain praise and worship songs anymore. They just irritate me. I, I love to listen to Christian music, but sometimes we'll listen to, we have Sirius XM and we'll listen to the message, which is the Christian radio station for music. And there's some songs that come on. I told Donna, like Brother Hagin said, I'd rather hear a donkey bray at midnight than listen to that garbage. I'd rather listen to the 60s music. At least I know that's going to be unsanctified. Hello. I just, I just don't tolerate it well, okay? That's just the bottom line. And so the question becomes then, why do we continue to focus on things that are not true? Because we're already full of God. One of my favorite hymns of the church, oh, I could sing this and cry. And I'm an organist, by the way. I used to play a Hammond B3. If you're Pentecostal, you know what that means. You can just make that thing go wah, 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 And all the ladies will go, oh, God. And I mean, you know, yeah, we, I know what it is. Hello. I know what it is. And we would sing this song. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. And I just cry, oh, I need thee, oh. I. And then the Lord said to me, why are, you ask, why are you saying you need me when you already got me? Yeah. yeah, but God, you don't understand. And God said, no, you don't understand. You already got me. You don't need to be singing, I need thee, oh, I need thee. You need to be saying, I got you, oh, I got you. Yeah. Every hour I have you. Why? Because... What you meditate on is where you're going to focus on. That's right. And when I focus on I need thee, oh, I need thee, I'm focused on lack. I'm not focused on supply. Come on. Yes. When I'm always looking for sin to confess, I'm focused on sin, not on God. You know, the Bible says, conf you know, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin. Yes. That word confess means to say the same thing as, right? So if you say the same thing about your sin that God says about your sin, what's he say? Forgiven. That's right. Now I'm going to focus on my righteousness. Yes. I remember years ago, I was trying to get over some things, and I would fall and fall and fall, and I felt so condemned. And God said, I want you, every time I want you to say, I am the righteousness of God. Amen. I said, God, but that wasn't very righteous. He said, it didn't matter. That was not the basis of your righteousness. Jesus is the basis of your righteousness. Right. Right. And if you'll believe that, you'll start acting holy more by accident than you ever did on purpose. Yes. Hello? So why are we singing these songs? You know, here's another one, I, and I really hate to pick on this. Why do I pick on praise and worship? Let me tell you why I pick. I told this in Tucson a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and... Um, Pastor Virgil and Pastor John both afterwards said, you know what, that's absolutely true. What I'm preaching today, other than the fact you can probably go online and listen to it again, but n most of you will probably forget most of it by the time next week rolls around. I'm just being honest with you. Unless you've taken notes, and, t and you know, most people in church will forget what the preacher preached on Sunday morning by Monday night. But they'll not forget what you sang in praise and worship. Now, I don't know what it is about music. Maybe we ought to go to sing in our sermons, but then we don't necessarily want to run people away. But, I mean, there's just something about praise and worship. There's something about singing that stays with us, okay? And so we remember those things. 
So now, let's say you're in the middle of the week and a problem arises. Now what are you going to sing? If you sing the song like we sang today, that's who you are. You're a good, good father. And I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's focused on the right thing. Yeah. Or you could sit there and sing, I'm desperate for you. Well, if I'm desperate for him, what's my focus? My focus is on my need, on what I don't have. But my focus needs to be on who I have. And I am his, and I am complete in him, yes. filled to the full. Yes. And if I remember that, when sickness comes my way, I'm not going to sit there pleading for God to heal me. I'm going to rise up and say, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. Yes. Your body was broken for me, that by his stripes I am healed. Not going to be. Would you let me share one quick testimony on that one? Sure. And, and, and then I promise to quit. <laughs> Praise God. You know, here's some years ago, about 2006, well, 2006, Don and I, Don have heard, you have to understand, I have wanted to go to Africa for a very long time. I felt the call to go to Africa back in the 80s. And in 91, I went to Kenya for the first time on an exploratory trip, spent time on the on the grass in the Methodist guest house in Nairobi, Kenya. I was praying in the Holy Ghost one time, and God laid out what I was to do in Kenya. And I wrote it down. And I was so excited to get this from God. I had heard from God. I knew it. So I came back to the United States. I walked into our house. And Donna says, how was your trip? It was wonderful. Pack up everything. We're moving to Kenya. God has given us an assignment. And she took my hand and she said, sweetheart, I love you. Have a wonderful time in Kenya. Don't forget you have a family that lives in the United States. <laughs> I was so angry at God, I said, God, how could you give me a wife who can't have the same vision that I have? How can two walk together unless they agree? Have you ever used the word against God? And, and I said, how can this be? And I heard the Holy Ghost say one time, he finally just said it this way, he says, rest in me. When it's time for you to go, she'll lead you. Well, in 2006, she came to me after an FCF conference in Crestline, California. She came to me and she said, I believe it is time for us to go to Kenya. Well, you didn't have to say it twice. I was ready to go. Within two or three weeks, she got very sick, and within a month, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and given 18 months to live. It came time for us to go to Kenya. We went to the doctor. We said, we're not asking your permission. We are telling you what we're going to do. We're going to Kenya because God told us to go to Kenya. And I know that you say she has pancreatic cancer. I know that she's weak. But I want you to know, we're going to follow God. And we believe by his stripes she's healed. I mean, the, the doctor thought I was crazy. I think the doctor thought maybe I wanted her to die. Because he told me about this, and I'm smiling the whole way through it. She's going to die. Why are you smiling? You don't understand. I said, oh, I fully understand. I worked with cancer patients. I know what pancreatic cancer is. I understand it completely, but I understand something else. The word says, by his stripes she's healed. Not, not going to be, she is. Now, she's healed. She may not look like it, but she is. And we went to Kenya. She preached all through Kenya that God had healed her body of cancer. We came back, took her to a specialist. The specialist says we're going to do the best we can to keep her comfortable in her latter days. These are such good reports, aren't they? Yeah. You know, you have, to, you have to remember when the good reports like that come along, you can't listen to them. All right? I'm not saying to ignore them. You just can't listen to them. You can't meditate there. You can't focus there. And so we focused on by his stripes we were healed. And we focused on that to the point that uh, uh, what, a couple months after we met with that specialist, he had us come back to do some more tests. And when he got done, he said to us, we don't know what happened, but we can find no mass. Now here's the mass in her previous, but there's nothing here. We don't know what happened. And Donna says, I know exactly what happened. My Jesus healed me. And that doctor said to us, I'm going to release you to your Jesus because he did a better job than I did. Amen. Praise God. And we're living testimonies. This is either Jesus healed her or this is the longest 18 months I've ever lived. <laughs> Hello. And she's not showing any signs of going downhill. Hello. 
Why? Because you get established in the Word. You know what the Word I'm not focusing on the need. I'm focusing on the provision. I'm not focusing on the lack. I'm focusing on the provision. I'm not focusing on sickness. I'm focusing on healing. I'm not focusing on sin. I'm focusing on righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Do I do everything right all the time? No. I had a employ. I, I, I worked. For, I had my own company, and and one of my clients. Uh, I was successful from keeping my wife to meet any of my clients for years, but this particular time she was with me when I had to meet with this client. And so the client came out. It was a lady, and she came out and she looked at Donna and she says, "Oh, Donna," she says, "You must be the luckiest woman alive." To have a husband that just never reacts and never gets upset and never allows any circumstances to bother him. Because I never did. If, if, if they came in all upset, I was just the peace in the midst of the storm. And I could bring peace. But Donna just cracked up laughing because she knew that wasn't always the case. Okay? <laughs> that I could also, I could remember a time that my dad irritated me. We were just engaged. He just irritated the fire out of me. And I could lose my temper like this. But I have my new fiance sitting next to me at the dinner table. I do not want her to see this side yet. You understand this, guys, right? There are some things we want to keep from our wives until we're married. Then it's too late. And so I'm just boiling on the inside of me. And my mother had chocolate pudding for dessert that night. And it was coming my way. And I took that pudding, I whipped it up like this, and I went, bam, right on my plate like that because I was so angry. That pudding bounced right off of that plate right into her lap. Now there's the manifestation of my anger. See, I was upset. I was angry. I was, I, was, I was not at peace. But you know what I've learned to do is not focus on those things, but focus on who I am in him. And the more I focused on who I am in him, the more those things started to fall away. We're no longer focused on our lack. Do we have lack? <laughs> Come talk to me. <laughs> if you want to focus on lack, I can tell you about it. I'm not going to really focus on it because at the end of me telling you what it's really like, we're going to tell you this, but God provides every need we have. This morning, one of our spiritual sons who lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, honored us, or honored me on his Facebook page. And what he said in there is, you've taught me how to believe God regardless of what it looks like. You had no money to go to Kenya, but you went anyway. You have no money to fulfill your ministry, but you're doing it anyway. How do you do that? By focusing on the supply. By focusing on God. We have to keep our minds on Christ Jesus. Whew. Quit pleading. You know, there's another one that we used to sing. Um, anointing fall on me. Ever sung that one? Anointing fall on me anointing. Well, you see, the problem with that is the Bible says that you have the anointing on the inside of you. Yeah. And so when you're focusing on anointing fall on me, you're not focusing on the fact that he's already there. You're looking for something outside. It used to irritate me when we used to sing songs like, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. I love these songs. Please don't misunderstand me. Hello, I can sing these songs and cry like the best of them. It, it builds up an emotion on the inside of me that just, mm. But let me tell you something. Holy Spirit lives inside of me. So if I'm in this place, he's in this place. Yes. Now we might tell him he's welcome here, but I don't like that come Holy Spirit. Oh, please come Holy Spirit and fill this place. I'm already here. Holy Spirit's in me. Holy Spirit is here. Now we're going to focus on the fact that the Holy Spirit is here. If we'll focus on that, then the Holy Spirit can really move. That's why sometimes during praise and worship, because we're so focused on the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit can operate. Yes. Because we're focused on those things. But if you just come in and sing some songs and blah, 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 and sit down, you're not focused on the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit won't move. They can't move. We need to be focused on the fact he is in me. He is here. Every need I have is met. Every sin I commit is forgiven. I've been made the righteousness of God 
in Jesus Christ. And the more you focus there, the more you stay there. I like what one guy said. He said, right believing leads to right living. It is not right living to right believing. It's right believing leads to right living. Let's focus on what God wants us to focus on. Praise God. Whew. I'm going to quit on that one. We could go on and on and on and on and on. But this is not an African church, so I have to stop. <laughs> you say, what's an African church? We'd have gone on until I was done. Services in Africa start at 8 in the morning, and oftentimes I get up to preach at noon. And they usually have one or two messages before me and a lot of praise and worship. And then they get up and they want me to preach for at least one or two hours. If I do a seminar, we'll do a seminar for five hours straight with no break. I'm exhausted by the time we're done. You do realize when in Kenya I don't preach in Swahili yet, so I have to have an interpreter. So everything, it takes twice as much time to get through stuff as it does here too. But God is good. And I just wanted to help you focus this year on the gospel. Focus that everything that you have is by grace. God has provided it to you, not according to your works, not according to your deeds, but because he loves you so very much. You don't deserve it, but God has given it to you. Then he gave you faith to receive it. And as we've received him, now let's walk this year in him. Let's walk this year receiving everything God has for us by his grace through faith. If you face sickness and disease, receive your healing. He's already provided it for you. My body doesn't feel it. Mine doesn't either sometimes. Hello? Yeah. There are times that, that we're driving and I've got pains in places I don't even want to talk about. And I have to remember, no, I'm not moved by this pain. I'm not moved by this temporal thing. I'm only moved by what the Word says. And the Word says, by His stripes, I am healed. Yes. If you fall, don't get moved by your fall. Understand, He has made you the righteousness of God. You are made righteous not on the, on, on the merit of your actions and deeds, but on the blood of Jesus. Praise God. Let's pray together. Did you get anything? Yes. All right. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word right now. I thank you that as this word goes out, Father, that you renew our minds by the Spirit to the things that you have already provided for us, our righteousness, our healing, and our provision, sanctified relationships, healed marriages, Whatever the need is, you have provided the answer for us. And Father, we choose today to focus on the answer, on the provision, in Jesus' name. Amen.